The answer lies in finding out who is changing the world. When we bring teachers to the discussion, everything changes. How many panel discussions have we been to? How many events have we been to when people discuss education and not one teacher on it? We change this. We change this today. We change this here and now. Underlining the need to promote the status of teachers in society and to put at the heart of the dialogue in education, Sunny Vake, founder of the Vake Foundation and the Global and Skills Forum, mentioned that respecting teachers is essential for positive education outcomes. Now we can say beyond doubt that respecting teachers is not only really an important moral duty, it's essential for positive educational outcomes. I will say it again. Respecting teachers is not only really an important moral duty, it is essential for positive educational outcomes. A crossroads. Signs are pointing in every direction, but we don't know where they lead. If we take the wrong path, we may get lost for a century. We may never even find our way back. Education has been tossed in the air, and we don't know where the pieces will fall. The audience had an emotional encounter with Rohingya speakers Hamed Allah and Zainab Akani, who narrated their backstories of struggle and despair. An emotionally charged Allah, who spent the first 15 years of his life in the country, on his way to Canada, recounted his experience of being physically kicked out of school when he was a child. A school system that was set up by the UNICEF and UNICEF in the refugee camp in Bangladesh. When I went there, the, uh, the teacher said to me, the headmaster of the school, he's the one who takes all the registration, he said to me, why do you want to be educated? People like you, you have no father and your mother is mentally ill. What's the purpose of that education? What are you going to do with it? So we cannot waste the resource that we have in this institute for you. So you should get lost and try to survive as long as you can. And I remember him kicking me on the chest and kicking me out of the school. So what did you do? What was your life like as a kid? I mean, after uh, someone tells you to survive as long as you can, there's a thing in me, there's a courage and hope inside me said to me that I'm going to show him someday. And that day, I went outside the camps, a coffee shop, working 16 hours a day, just making about less than Canadian 10 cents to provide for my mom and sister, my little sister. And for me, I, I could bear, you know, I got to Dubai, I haven't slept yet. I got, I got here yesterday and I haven't slept yet because this is the biggest opportunity in my life that I could talk about the rights of my people. You know, this is not just an opportunity for me. This is an opportunity for millions of Rohingyas who look for a better day. You know, when I'm there, people are hugging me and crying to me because they want education. These people are not getting, they, they don't want anything from you. All they want is education, that education that I was provided. Canada giving me a home. All of you has given me a home in, in different parts of the world, giving me a platform to speak about the crisis. Experienced systematic discrimination as a student, but went on to complete her undergraduate studies. My teacher said, oh, why don't you bowing? And I said, because I'm a Muslim and we don't bow to anything other than God. And uh, she said, oh, you are Kala. Kala is the degotory uh, word that they use for the Muslim people. Um, and she said, go to the corner and stand there. So starting from that day, until I, I graduate, I have suffered physical abuse, mental abuse, and all kinds of assaults. But I am among the one person, luckiest Rohingya people uh, to go to school because 99% of us, they didn't have a chance to go to school because of the systematic barriers from the Burmese government. She further elaborated on how education and vocational training for Rohingya children is a